Hey, this is Pastor Bungie Garrett, and I want to take some time today to present you with another word of encouragement. Well, it's the fifth day of Black History Month, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to honor all of the abolitionists who took a stand against the atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, this, of course, included our first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln officially freed every slave here in America on January the 1st, 1863. That's when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. There was also John Brown, the evangelical Christian, who was determined to abolish slavery here in the States. And it was just before the American Civil War when Brown tried to instigate a slave uprising there in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. However, he was captured and charged with treason, and after a speedy trial, he was sentenced to death and then hanged. And it's just a tragic ending for such an incredible man. There was also William Lloyd Garrison, who was also a Christian crusader, who encouraged more of a pacifist approach to abolition. And with this as his goal, you know, he created a popular anti-slavery paper, which was called The Liberator, as he sought to establish the abolition of slavery through the means of rational discourse. We should also honor the memory of our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. You know, President Adams, he was a staunch abolitionist who railed against the Democrat Party's commitment to slavery. And not only that, but John Quincy Adams was also the one who represented the Africans who were charged for their rebellion on the Spanish slave ship, better known as La Amistad. That's right, John Quincy Adams argued before the Supreme Court that the African men who broke free of their chains and then killed their captors, they were completely justified. And the reason why was because they had the right to fight for their freedom as much as anybody else. Our sixth president not only believed in the unalienable rights of every single person, but he was ready to defend those rights as he stood before the Supreme Court. And after winning that court case, Adams helped to set a new legal precedent, which then helped to abolish slavery here in America. We should also consider the way in which the anti-slavery advocates within our own Congress uh, fought for the freedom of every slave here in our nation. This includes the Slave Trade Act of 1794, which prohibited the building or outfitting of ships in U.S. ports for the purpose of international slave trade. And this act was then signed into law by President George Washington on March 22nd, 1794. Not only that, but this law was then strengthened in 1800 when our Congress sharply raised the fines for anyone using ships for uh, you know, slave trade. And, and simultaneously, they, they also awarded informants with the entire value of any slave ship that was seized. Then on January uh, 1st, 1807, a small group of Southern congressmen joined together with their Northern peers, uh, and together they voted to abolish the African slave trade. And this bill, which was signed into law by President Thomas Jefferson, became effective January 1st, 1808. Now think about that for a moment. The African slave trade was abolished here in, in the United States back in 1808. Now, now, it's true that this wasn't the end of slavery in America, and yet this was a landmark decision which set the stage for the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln would issue 55 years later. Now, in order to put this into a global perspective, we should take a moment to consider the way in which the trans-Saharan slave trade continued long after the transatlantic slave trade was shut down here in the U.S. You might not know this, but Muslims have been engaging in the trans-Saharan slave trade since the 7th century AD. In other words, 10 centuries before the transatlantic slave trade even began, Arab Muslims were already engaging in the atrocities of the trans-Saharan slave trade. And not only that, but some Arab Muslims have continued engaging in the trans-Saharan slave trade ever since. Now think about that for a moment. You know, it's, it's been more than 200 years since our government shut down the transatlantic slave trade. And yet, despite this fact, uh, many Muslims, uh, Arab Muslims have continued engaging in the trans-Saharan slave trade throughout this entire time. And, and while it's true that they initially captured white slaves in Eastern Europe, this slave trade in Eastern Europe became more and more difficult as the military powers of Europe continued to increase. And, and here's how uh, Senegalese author uh, put it, and I, and I quote him here, Initially, the Arab Muslims in Eastern and Central Europe took white slaves to sell them to Arabia, 
but the growing military power of Europe put an end to Islamic expansion. And now that there was a shortage of slaves, Arab Muslims were looking massively to black Africa. That's right. The Arab Muslims shifted their attention from Europe to Africa, where they discovered an established system of slavery, which had been created by indigenous African tribes who were enslaving other African tribes. Here's how the same Senegalese author explained it, and I quote, Arab Muslims encountered already existing structures which facilitated the purchase of slaves for their purposes. That's right, the dominant tribes there in Africa were happy to sell their slaves to the Arab Muslims, who then carried these captives away into northern Africa and Egypt and into Saudi Arabia. And it's sad to say that an untold number of black Africans have been enslaved by Arab Muslims ever since the 7th century. Here's how Robert Spencer explains it in his article, Slavery, Christianity, and Islam. And I quote him here, While the European and American slave trade get lavish attention from historians, as well as from Mao Maoing reparation advocates who, and their marks, guilt-ridden contemporary politicians, the Islamic slave trade actually lasted longer and brought suffering to a larger number of people. That's right, the Islamic slave trade began in the 7th century and has since then enslaved more than 17 million Africans. Here's how Robert Spencer put it, and I quote again, It is exceedingly ironic that Islam has been presented to American blacks as the egalitarian alternative to the white man's slave religion of Christianity since Islamic slavery operated on a larger scale than did the Western slave trade and lasted longer. That's right. And as a matter of fact, there are still Muslim countries today where it's still legal to own slaves. And seeing how Muslim slavers primarily enslave non-Muslims, then this would most certainly explain why there are so many black Africans who have converted to the religion of Islam. Not only that, but this also explains why so many African authors and journalists refuse to report on this issue. Here's how one African journalist explained it, and I quote, most of the African authors have not yet published a book on the Arab Muslim slave trade out of religious solidarity. There are 500 million Muslims in Africa, and it's better to blame the West than talk about the past crimes of Arab Muslims. That's right. It's easier to focus this energy on the atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade, which ended 200 years ago, than to focus on the trans-Saharan slave trade, which in some forms is still taking place today. And not only that, but listen, we must also acknowledge the fact that the Muslim countries that have criminalized slavery were actually influenced and pressured by Christian abolitionists and not the other way around. Here's how Robert Spencer explains it, and I quote again, the pressure to end it moved from Christendom into Islam, not the other way around. There was no Muslim Clarkson, Wilberforce, or Garrison. That's right, we never saw an Islamic abolitionist movement. Rather than realizing that slavery is a crime against humanity, you know, the Muslims were pressured by the abolitionists from the West to end the trans-Saharan slave trade. And it's sad to say that there's evidence that leads us to believe that many Arab Muslims are still engaging in this slave trade even today. And here's how Robert Spencer puts it, and I quote again, there is evidence that slavery still continues beneath the surface in some majority Muslim countries, as well, notably Saudi Arabia, which only abolished slavery in 1962. Think about that for a moment. Saudi Arabia didn't abolish slavery until 1962. That's nearly 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln. Yemen and Oman ended legal slavery in 1970. And Niger didn't abolish slavery until 2004. 2004. Think about that. And listen, in the ban there in Niger, it's, it's being widely ignored. And, and so as we celebrate Black History Month, let's make sure that we remember all of the white abolitionists here in America who stood upon biblical principles that all people are created equal no matter their race. At the, at the same time here, we should spend time praying for the 50 million people who are still enslaved in other areas of the world. And let's pray for the light of the gospel message to bring liberty to these nations who are still living under the bondage of Islamic slavery. Not only that, but let's preach the gospel of grace so that we can accomplish the great commission of Jesus Christ.
because it's the great commission of Jesus Christ which sets the captives free and provides them with the liberty and the love of our Lord. In this way, we become those abolitionists who are still fighting the good fight of faith and all for the glory of God.